so today's a little bit different. Um, we're not going to write any code today. Um, we're not going to analyze any algorithms. We're not going to, you know, wrap, try to wrap our brains around the mysteries of recursion or learn them some new feature of Java. Um, the next two classes are devoted to introducing you to something that I think you need to be reintroduced to. It's not something that's new to you, um, but it's something that I think you take for granted um, because you grew up with it. You grew up around it. Um, you know, the students in this class, I'm guessing, were probably born around the, the turn of the millennium, right? So you guys actually, you know, came into being at a time where the thing we're going to talk about was already fairly mature. Um, and so this is one of those things where, you know, my goal today is actually to try to re-mystify something for you, uh, something that you guys use every day, uh, but something that will also really shape your future in technology going forward. It's something that you need to understand in order to understand how to best leverage the world of technology around you. And this is the internet and the World Wide Web. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna continue that conversation on Monday. Uh, this is also designed to set you up to work on your final project, because one of the best ways to build something, so MP4 wraps up this weekend, uh, one of the best ways to build something impressive today um, while doing as little work as possible and while leveraging the work that other people are doing is to have your app or have your uh, program use data or computation or other features provided by what are called web APIs. And so we'll get there on Monday. We'll talk a little bit about how you can actually um, make what amounts to a function call across the internet to a remote server to have it do work for you or do something cool. Retrieve some data that you might not have locally, um, run some processing that you might not have the power to do locally. This is a major, you know, you guys have already done this for MP4 on some level. If you're completing this checkpoint, or I think actually this was part of the last checkpoint, right? You guys have attached your app to our back end. Um, and the way that those two pieces of code are communicating is over what's called a web API. So we'll talk about that on Monday. But today the goal is to give you a little bit of sense of what the internet actually is, okay? So before we can talk about the web, and before we can talk about web APIs, it really, I think, helps to sort of back up and think a little bit, talk a little bit about what the internet is. Uh, because um, it's sort of, I guess, not surprising because it works so well, but a lot of people, including a lot of computer scientists, including a lot of people in this room, don't really have much of an idea about how this actually works. Now, you guys are sitting there with your laptops. I'm sure you're all looking directly at my beautiful slides, but even if you're not, even if you're using some other, um, you know, tool or some other service, you're online, right? If I turned off the internet in this room, I think that the attendance would probably drop quite a bit, right? Obviously, the attendance would drop to zero because our attendance tracker wouldn't work, but I think people would stop coming because, you know, what can you do? So think about it this way. What can you do with your computer today without an internet connection? When I was growing up, we, our computer spent a long time, when I was in high school, spent a long time without being connected to the internet. We got little bits of internet time that we would use every week, and my mom would very fairly divide them between me and my brother and sister and stuff like that. It was like, you know, you get these disks from AOL that had 30 minutes on them. So you would divide that 30 minutes up very carefully. Um, now we expect all of our devices, our laptops, our phones, um, even these little, you know, $5 devices we buy from Amazon, right, to be online all the time, right? So what created this, this revolution? So today we're gonna talk about the internet and a little bit about how the internet works. I hope this is fun for you. I really like this stuff. Um, I think the internet is probably the most significant piece of technology that humans have ever created. You know, you, you, you can fight me on this if you want fire, the wheel, um, stuff like that. But I think the internet is actually uh, more transformative than some of those other things. Um, because I think the internet, um, reflects fundamental human desire to communicate. That's why we invented written language, right? We wanted to be able to communicate, document things, and the internet is sort of the ultimate flowering of this desire. Okay, and again, I really like talking about this stuff, so Asha taught an entire class, um, you know, a few years ago on the internet. You can find all these videos online, including videos of me, like, you know, going into the wall jack in my office and ripping that out and figuring out what was going on back there. Talk a little bit about that today, later, right? Um, 
me hiding in server rooms and stuff like that. Anyway, it's good stuff. So uh, if you want to know more, uh, there's a lot of videos of me talking about various pieces of this. Okay, so at the end of the day, what is this thing that you guys are using? Right now, you know, the computers in this room, I wish I had, like, data on this, but are probably communicating with thousands of other computers spread all over the world, okay? Um, how did we get to this place? This is really cool, right? How did we get there? How does it work? What's behind it? How did it evolve this way? And what's so special about it? So those are the things we're gonna talk about today. All right. So the first thing that the internet is, you know, is there's this, the, how many people have seen the internet as a series of tubes uh, video? That's a meme that I think precedes you guys a little bit by maybe 10 years. Um, anyway, but the internet is a series of tubes. It's a series of wires. Um, so what this graph is showing you is overlaid on a map of the United States. These are the main internet backbone links that we've established in this country, all right? And if you pick up a map of France or if you pick up a map of Australia, um, it looks kind of similar. Now, if you pick up a map of you know, Africa or certain parts of the world, this looks different. But in first world countries, one of the ways that we've enabled the internet is we've laid cables. Okay, we're gonna talk about what those cables are, uh, but, but here's a map showing, and this is, act, you can actually use this map to figure out, like let's say you're on Facebook right now, and let's say you're actually talking to a Facebook server that's located in California. What path is the information taking from you to California. How many people would, how many people thought maybe that happened wirelessly, like over a satellite or something like that, right? Anybody think, I mean, it's a reasonable thing to think. You guys are using a wireless device right now. Not the case, right? This happens over wire. So we're, let's see, we're in here somewhere, right? This is Chicago. You can see there's a lot of internet connections that come together and join up in Chicago, and you can see that in a couple other major cities, but we're down here somewhere, right? So your internet traffic, it's probably, if you're communicating with the server in California, might start here, and it's gonna run across these really, and, and these are really high speed, sometimes what we call the internet backbone. The companies that operate this infrastructure, you have never heard of before. You know, the Google, Google and Facebook have started to own a little pieces of this, right? But most of the companies that operate this are names that you've never heard of, right? This is, but this is the fastest, most high capacity links that we've created. These run for hundreds of miles, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about exactly how data gets from one place to another, but this is, you know, uh, again, many of you are probably too young to remember Al Gore talking about the information superhighway. This is the information superhighway, right? It is a real thing, okay? Now, anyone, can anyone sort of spot something about this map? There's something interesting about this map. If you look at where the connections are, yeah. What's that? Is no one in South Dakota? Yeah, what's going on up here? That's interesting, yeah. There is no, there are no high-speed connections in South Dakota, apparently. What I, you know, no one has ever noticed that before. What is, there's like these dead ends here. It's like, oh, I sent some data into South Dakota and it never came out again. Um, I feel like it's more likely that South Dakota like didn't share data with this survey or something like that, and so they're, yeah, no, that's interesting. No one has ever seen that before. Um, but what else? Does anyone ever drive across country? Anyone ever driven across some of the big interstate highways? So if you overlay the interstate highway map on this map, what you'll see is that a lot of these internet backbone links run along major US highways. Why is that? You know, why, why wouldn't I just run these from, you know, from point A to point B? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you actually have to like bury these cables, right? There's a process involved in laying them, and they also have to be maintained, okay? So putting them alongside the interstate highway system makes a little bit of sense, right? Now there's features of the interstate highway system that we try not to duplicate with this. So for example, you know, how many of you have ever wondered about like, why when I'm on a highway does it kind of like go like this? Why don't highways just go straight? It's like, you know, I'm going straight to Chicago. Why doesn't 57 just run straight to Chicago, like dead straight, no turns? 
The reason for that is actually because of you. If we do that, you guys get so distracted while driving, you fall asleep, you know, whatever, right? I'm serious, so highway designers build in a little bit of undulation in order to keep you alert, right? That's why we do this. There are some sections of highways that are really dead straight, um, and I've read things like, you know, there are higher accident rates there because people get distracted, right? All right, now, okay, so here's another question. Those interstate highways, if you, there's an older map, right? So there's another map I can overlay on here that's also gonna line up with that. Anybody know what that is? So this does match up with some of the interstate highways, not all of them, but some of them. The interstate highways themselves were in many cases laid out to follow. If you've driven 57 up to Chicago, what do you notice alongside you for a good part of the route? Railroad, yeah, there's a train line there. So this is like, we're actually, the internet is actually following paths that were laid out hundreds of years ago across the country. We made decisions about where to put railroads, those decisions guided where the highways were gonna go, those decisions have guided where we're gonna put internet infrastructure. This is kinda cool. All right. This is also the case when you talk about internet connections that span, that, that span continents. Okay, so again, I just wanna make this very clear because I think for some of you this may be surprising. There are cables. This is all done with wires. There is a wire, so if, if you wanted to actually follow the path of your data from here to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever server you're communicating with, there is a wire in this building, right? There's one that comes right out of this router over here. So we could start with this router. If I pull this off the wall, which I'm not gonna do because Greg will get mad at me, um, there's a wire behind it. If I follow that wire, your data is traveling along that wire until it meets somewhere in this building, there's gonna be a, a locked cabinet that's gonna have a bunch of pieces of equipment in it. That's where that wire leads, and then if I follow that, there's another wire that leads out of that. If I follow that wire, there's another wire that leads out of that. You're gonna be on a wire from wherever you are from this router all the way to a server in some big warehouse full of computers somewhere in the world. If your traffic spans a continent, if you're communicating with a server that's actually located in England or Australia, then you get to go underwater. Right, so then we actually start to go on these undersea cables. So you can see here again, you know, these are very US centric maps, I realize. So here's a map of the United States, and this is a map showing all, or at least a lot of, the overseas uh, cables that we have pulled to enable internet communication across these long distances. So there's a cable that runs like from somewhere on the east coast of the United States, and a bunch of these cables run across and terminate in a bunch of places on the west coast of Europe, right? And, you know, putting these down is pretty much how you would expect. There's a boat that sails from one port to another, and it's got literally a big reel at the back, and as it's sailing across the ocean, it's unraveling, it's unspooling cable behind it, right? Which then floats down to the ocean floor, or however deep it, it sinks, and lays there for, you know, tens or hundreds of years. Some of these overseas cables have been in operation for decades, okay? The, I, I don't have pictures of this, but um, it's actually really, I, I find this stuff really fascinating. I like infrastructure, but um, if, you, if you want to find the places where these, so somewhere, somewhere on the eastern seaboard is a place where this cable comes out of the water, right? It's gotta come out somewhere. There are typically these very nondescript buildings that they build around these because these are sort of sensitive sites. Like if you were a terrorist and you wanted to attack the United States and, and knock down our communications infrastructure, knocking an overseas cable offline might be something that you would try to do. So there's not like a big sign that says overseas cable internet here, right? Instead, in some places, they've actually built buildings that are designed to look like apartment buildings from the outside, except nobody lives there and there's only ever one car in the parking lot, and what's inside that building is the place where the cable comes up and then hooks into other parts of the internet infrastructure. You can, it's, it's sort of easy to identify these buildings. They have all sorts of coolers on the top because there's lots of electronics in there, but in some places they've at least tried to put them, put up a facade to make it look like something that it's not. Yeah, question. No idea. 
I think, start over, right? So the question was like, how do you repair these things? Um, so the, the new ones, I think, are, are probably much easier to take care of, and we're gonna talk about wh why in a minute. There were older versions of these cables where literally you actually had to have um, vacuum tubes, like every mile or so, and some of those are still running, right? So some of this stuff is just really in really good shape. Um, there's also a lot of redundancy here. So you can see that there's a lot of cables that have been pulled across the North Atlantic, for example. There's a bunch of cables now that have been pulled across the Pacific Ocean that connect us with Asia and other places, right? So if one of them goes offline, it's not necessarily the end of the world. There's enough spare capacity to route around. At this point, some of those companies that you have heard of, like Google and Facebook, own cables. They've decided to actually start establishing their own infrastructure. So they might own an entire cable, or they might own part of a cable, right? That means that all of the data that travels on that cable is from like one Google data center to another Google data center, or one Facebook data center to another Facebook data center. So some of these big internet companies have started to move so much data that it's actually made sense for them to start investing directly in the infrastructure that they need to do that. All right, so what are these cables? Okay, so here's the other really, these are the things that sort of surprised me when I started learning about this stuff, right? And I hope they'll surprise you. Whoop, that looks cool. Again, it's the one time. All right, here's a fiber optic cable, right? Um, this is, you know, on some level, kind of a mock-up of what these undersea cables look like, right? So you've got an outer sheath, you've got a bunch of these individual cables inside, and what material is, what are the little, threads that are poking out of there. Does anybody know? Fiber optic cable made out of optic, glass. Yeah, so the individual fibers, very hard to see, it's probably easier to see in front of you, that are running these are glass. And actually, so if you go to, there's in, in upstate New York, actually it's upstate New York, it's in western New York, uh, there's the Corning Company. So Corning is an old company, and for years and years, they made glass for things like plateware, and cups, and saucers, and stuff like that, right? So you might think, like, this isn't really a growth industry. But if you go to the Corning factory now, they have, like, this incredible visitor center. It's just, like, dripping with money, right? Corning now is making their money by, because they are one of the only companies in the world that can make glass of high enough quality to use in fiber optic cables. And actually, there's actually, at least a few years ago, there was actually a little bit of a shortage of fiber optic cable because we were um, running so much of it to try to build out the internet and make it faster and allow it to carry more data, and some of the companies couldn't keep up with it. Actually, there are really, really um, high cost facilities that you need to maintain to make glass that is of this quality. So just so you understand, this isn't the glass that's in the doors of Follinger. It's not the glass that's on the screen of your iPhone. This is really, this has to be very, very, very high quality, very clear, very pure, right? Uh, to allow signals to travel in it for a long period of time. So here, this is what these cables actually are. So, it, and, and actually the other thing that's cool about, the, about glass is that you find fiber optic cables way quicker than you would think. So in any building, so again, let's go back to thinking about this router. So if I pull this router off the wall, the cable behind it is gonna be copper. That cable can only run about 100 meters before it has to have this, the signal has to be refreshed, it has to be amplified. And so usually what we'll find is that somewhere in this building is a switch that takes those copper cables in and what comes out, oh, come on, don't do that. Thank you. Um, what comes out is glass. So there are fiber optics in this building, right? Those fiber optics run probably through some sort of maintenance tunnel to some other building on campus um, where they meet up with other fiber optics. And then um, the thing, so I actually got a chance to tour this at uh, the university I used to work at. And, you know, you guys use a lot of data, right? I mean, that's the fun thing about being in college. You guys get to browse the web all the time. So you would assume that somewhere, right, it's sort of like, you th the problem is we think about data like water, right? We would assume that somewhere on campus, there's like a really thick cable that we need to carry all of the data that you guys use, right? I mean, it makes sense, right? Everyone here is browsing the web all the time. You guys are like streaming movies and doing all this stuff that's like, cr uses crazy amounts of data. Shouldn't there be some like thick, you know, cable, maybe like even like this, right? So it turns out that all of the traffic for a university of this size 
can be carried on just a couple of very, very thin pieces of fiber optic cable. That stuff is so good, right? Such high capacity that you would be shocked to find that somewhere at the edge of campus is like a pipe that has like a little wire going into it, and that has all the data for the entire campus traveling across, right? And that goes up to the city of Champaign, maybe, where it meets up with another cable. I suspect that our traffic eventually gets up to Chicago, and then from there, who knows? All right. So here are the things to take away from this, okay? We're gonna talk about wireless infrastructure in a minute, but most of the infrastructure that we've had to create to support this computer network, right, this transformative, you know, way of connecting everybody on Earth is wired. This is real physical stuff. Wireless is mainly used at the very edge of the network. So today, most of the time, the way you guys connect to the internet, whether it's through your phone or whether it's through your laptop, is through some sort of wireless connection. Right, so I've got routers in here. This, in case you don't know, is a wireless router. You can see there's about a dozen that are arrayed throughout Follinger uh, to provide coverage uh, of this building. They're all over campus, right? This is Wi-Fi infrastructure, right? There are like billions of Wi-Fi access points that people have set up in various places. With your phone, you connect to a different type of wireless infrastructure that we'll talk about in a sec. But that's mainly the first hop. Past that point, most of the rest of the communications are over wired infrastructure, right? And so you can think about all of the investments we've had to make in physical infrastructure to support this system, right? That's what's so cool about it. And then again, most of that wired, most of those wired connections, most of the duration of those are over glass. As soon as possible, you get to fiber optic cable. It is so much higher bandwidth. It requires so much less infrastructure, right? So those long, you know, 100 a mile cables we were talking about before, um, there's really no way that we could run those using copper. Uh, it would just require too much infrastructure, whereas a fiber optic cable can carry a signal for miles with very little uh, loss of signal, very little degradation. So those signals can go a long way before they have to hit some other piece of infrastructure and, and get refreshed. All right. So, I mean, again, if you think about things that have enabled the internet other than the work of some extremely clever computer scientists that we're about to talk about, glass, fiber optic cable. I mean, if we didn't have that, we could not have built the internet, right? It would just have been, cost way too much. Um, okay. So, and again, if you guys want to see this, I did this. I thought it was kind of fun. There, these are links to videos that I did at, at UB. So, essentially, we kind of, like, started at a router or at a jack in the wall, and we kind of walked through the process of getting off campus. And you could do that here, too, right, if you could find the right person to talk to, right? There's somebody who could let me into the networking closet here, and then there would be a wire that runs, I don't know, maybe over to the union, and there's another closet there, and then we could follow that all the way off, off of campus, and then that person would also know, like, where the data goes after that point. All right. All right, so we talked a little bit about Wi-Fi, right? Um, and, those, you know, that's something that you guys have, are, I think, are kind of used to seeing around, right, these ubiquitous Wi-Fi routers, right? This is short-distance wireless infrastructure. What I think some of you have not learned to identify, which is also kind of cool, is the connections that your phones are using when they're outdoors. So Wi-Fi is mainly used to establish connectivity indoors, although if you go to some cities in Europe and some places in the United States, you can actually find Wi-Fi like in public parks in New York City or Chicago, right? Um, but what are, these, what's a, what are these cellular data connections? How, how are those set up, right? Okay, so... How many people have ever seen something like this or noticed something like this? If you've been driving around, particularly along highways. Um, this is a cell tower, okay? The, these things right here are basically kind of the equivalent of this guy, except they're a little bit different. They operate in a different frequency range, um, and the protocols they use to connect to clients are a little bit different. But these are cellular radios, okay? They're hooked up to the tower. You'll see they're always connected. So there's something distinctive about this tower. Right? Has anyone noticed this? this? This is not unusual to see, but there's something, ge what, what's distinctive about this geometrically? If you've ever seen this, this is one of the ways that you can identify these towers. What's typically true about them? This is not always true. If you go to a city sometimes, you find these wireless um, routers just attached to a side of a building or something like that, right? Some building owners will rent space to a cell company to put up infrastructure on their building to provide service to a particular area. But particularly out in space, right? You know, out in the hinterland, right, where we're located. What do you? What's true about most of these towers? 
there's, all, there's something in common about them that, that should give you a clue about how, how the cell system is set up. Who can notice this? See it twice here in this picture. Yeah. Yeah, I've got this equilateral triangle, right? These towers almost always have this feature. So you can see I've got one at the base of the tower that's configured one way, and I've got a second one a little higher up the tower that's configured another way. And these are actually probably two different cellular providers. One of those might be Sprint, the other one might be AT&T. Why are they equilateral? Well, I don't have a good picture of this, unfortunately, but if you, if it turns out, if you want to cover as much space with as few towers as possible, the right way to do this is to have every cell look like an equilateral, uh, sorry, a hexagon. And that allows you to basically tile, so it's like tessellation, right? I'm tiling the entire surface of Illinois, uh, trying to make sure that at any given point, you're within range of one of these towers so that you can get service. If you do that, the places where each hexagon comes together are these equilateral triangles. So this tower is serving three cells. It has antennas that are pointed this way. This is for company A, right? It has antennas pointed this way that serve one cell. It has antennas pointed this way that serve another cell. And it has antennas pointed that way that serve three cells, that, that serve a third cell. So these towers are actually positioned where three different cells come together. That's the goal, right? Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is that, you know, these two companies have not agreed on what the best way is to divide up whatever part of the country this is in, because you can see that the two uh, parts of the, the, the two triangles are, are aligned differently, right? So that probably means that, you know, they probably agreed to put the tower in this place as kind of a compromise between the two of them, uh, but they've turned, they've decided to divide up space a little bit differently. All right, so, and this is actually, I mean, I, in previous years, I mean, you guys are so used to this, right? But, you know, that was the second big evolution the, in, the internet went through, um, and that's, I think, really what made it so ubiquitous, right? It's now all this wireless connectivity that we've built out. This has also required an enormous amount of infrastructure. Um, so both these short-range wireless connections that you use, that we refer to typically as Wi-Fi, and then medium-range wireless connections that we set up, that are set up typically and operated by cellular providers, right? Okay, and so what does this all result in, right? So, so here is, this is, a, this is a cool animation. So this is essentially showing an animation that's estimating <coughs> internet activity in different parts of the world by time of day, right? So if you watch this, right, so here is probably morning in the United States, right? Now we're into evening, things get a little bit more quiet, and then here's morning, uh, again, right? Um, there, were, there, were, there were periods of time in this country where there were actually these massive email spikes when people got to work. Like everybody gets to work at nine o'clock, the first thing they do is check their email. I suspect that's not as true anymore because people are checking email all the time, right? And so um, it's probably a little bit more spread out, right? But what do you notice about this map, right? If you just look at this, right? I think this, this, I think this graphic is a couple years old, um, but it's probably not, that far off today. Um, what do you notice about this? What, what can you, what are some observations about the internet um, and how the internet has propagated that you can make from looking at this? Yeah. Yeah, so, so it does favor populous areas, right? So if I look at this, I can see like, so for example, has anyone ever been to Australia before? So like nobody lives in the middle of Australia. Right? It's like a desert that goes on for hundreds of miles, right? So most of the population of Australia lives on the west coast. So this is actually pretty accurate, right? There's a little chunk of people over here, but like there's one or two lights in the middle here, um, but there's, there's very uh, little population there. So on some level, this follows population, but there's a huge population center here that is not reflective. Several of them, actually. Right, so, you know, so again, if, if I look at the United States, I can kind of, if I look at Australia, I can kind of see that nobody lives in this great desert here. Um, Europe, I can see kind of, you know, it's, it's pretty densely populated throughout. But, but what else, what else is this telling me? Yeah. It's not, it's not just that there's not data. I, I, li I like that answer. So the answer was there's no data for Africa, right? That's actually not the case. 
right? There's very little internet penetration in Africa. There's very little internet usage. So that's a great point. Look at this. This is the most, you know, this is the most populous continent. And dark. So at this point, I can't remember what the exact numbers are. They change frequently. But I think we're only to the point where like 60 or 65 percent of the population of the Earth has regular internet access, okay? Now, you guys are very privileged to have 24-7 access to the internet. By regular internet access, what we mean is like maybe once a day they might be at an internet cafe or something like that, right? That's what we mean by regular. And even based on that definition, we're only about to 65 percent. What are the what? The white coast? Oh, yeah, I, I don't know if these are just done to help show, like, the boundaries of the various continents, right? Yeah, I don't think there's any, that's a great question. I don't know why these are white. There are, you know what, actually, I bet I do know why these are white, because I think there's people living there, right? If you were gonna live in Greenland, there's plenty of coastline, right? Isn't that where you're gonna live, right? Um, again, I doubt very many people live in the interior of Greenland. So I suspect this is actually probably following a, a, a population trend. So anyway, you guys, the, so the exciting thing about this, right, I think, you know, I think that it's easy today sometimes to feel like you guys are a little late to this party, where the party is the internet. But you're not, because there's still a third of the Earth, a third of the world's population that we haven't brought online yet. And those people are really interesting internet users. Those people are people for who access to the internet is gonna totally change their lives, all right? You know, we've kind of, everyone, all the boring people, we've already hooked up to the internet, all right? All the first world people and stuff like that, it's like, whatever, okay, now I can get better access to Netflix, you know? Uh, but the people out there that don't have regular internet access, this is, the internet's gonna be something that when they do start to get connected to it, is really gonna have the potential to change their lives, and you guys will have a chance to be involved in that. All right. So here's the thing, right? At the end of the day, all this work that we've done, and, and actually, you know, again, I was thinking about this this morning, so you sort of wonder, like, what drives us as human beings, right? What drives us to do things, right? Why do we do, like, why do we build things like this? And yes, it's true that the internet has made a lot of people rich. Right? But if you think about all the work that's been done across the entire globe to create this system, I think there's something deeper and more fundamental going on than that. Right? I mean, if you're sitting here in this room, you can browse the website of countries with which we do not have friendly relationships. Right? But we've still decided, hey, we should connect our networks together. Right? We should allow our citizens you know, in certain cases, and there's plenty of internet censorship out there, um, you know, but we should allow them to, you know, use Facebook, exchange messages with each other, right? I mean, and I think there, again, there's something very deep and human about this effort, right? Because people, human beings want to communicate with each other. And this is the kind of a really um, beautiful example of us working together across countries, across nations, uh, between friends and enemies and in a variety of different contexts to make something like this happen. So right now, if you get online, you can potentially connect to billions of other machines, right, through all the shared infrastructure that we've built, right? Most of the time, your first connection is wireless, but at that point, there's a wire that you can literally follow to the other person's computer. All right, so, so now we have this substrate, right? We've built these wires. We have a way to send electric signals, electronic signals from point A to point B. But we haven't actually answered the question of how we're gonna use this capability to enable devices to communicate with each other. So this is the second level. So the, at, at some level, the internet represents physical infrastructure, a huge investment in physical infrastructure. But the other thing we also have to do, and again, this is something that somehow we all got together and agreed on, is we have to agree about how we're going to use this thing to actually enable communication, okay? And to do this requires a new concept that is really a computer science concept. It's not something that we've talked about yet, um, 
but it's something that the computer science community had, you know, contributed to the system. I mean, if you think about it up till now, right, what we've talked about is really like ECE, right? They built all that hardware and all that stuff and all the wires and EE did a lot of that, right? You should thank them for that, right? That's an incredible contribution, right? At this point, now we need to start writing software, okay? So a communication protocol, so protocol is an interesting word. I mean, protocol has its roots in, you know, diplomatic relationships, right? The protocol for receiving a head of state, right? If someone comes to visit the White House, there's a set of rules that you follow about how they're received and what sort of, you know, banquet you're gonna hold and how you address them and who walks in the door first and second and stuff like that. All this has been negotiated, right? A communication protocol is not that similar, not that dissimilar. It's a set of rules that we establish so that two devices can communicate with each other. So now we have this way that we can send signals back and forth and we can actually use those signals to represent, you know, bits and use those bits to represent text or images or whatever, but how do we all work together so that this just doesn't become cacophonous, right? How do we work together so that we can actually make sense of what to do with this thing? All right, so, uh, so IP, you know, how many people have heard the acronym IP before? Like your computer requests like an IP address, right? So IP is the second place where we see this word internet, right? IP stands for internet protocol. This is the base protocol that all internet connected devices are as, as, uh, as you know, uh, expected to adhere to, okay? And it's designed to address a couple of fundamental questions about how we use this, this network, okay? So here are the couple things that, and IP, one of the best things about IP is that it doesn't do very much. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about design principles on Monday for the internet and why it's been so successful, but one of the best things about IP is that it's small. It's a very minimal set of expectations and requirements. So here are the things that IP sets up. The first thing that, I, the first problem with using this big network that we need to address is how do we address each other? What do we call each other? If I want to communicate with one of Facebook's servers that has my news feed on it or whatever, how do I send it a message? That message needs to have a destination and it needs to have a source so that the server can send the data back to me. So what do we call each other? Okay, so IP specifies the format of what are referred to as IP addresses, okay? And here's an IP address. This is in what's called dotted decimal form, right? Uh, this is the first iteration of IP, and probably the only mistake that the creators of IP made was not anticipating how big the internet was going to get. So we'll talk in a minute about why this is the case, right? So these are old format IP addresses, okay? How many people have ever seen something that looks like this before? Like when you're setting up a router or whatever, you've been connecting, okay. How many people have seen one that looks like this before? All right, so this is the future, and by future I mean this is the sixth version of the IP protocol that we've been rolling out now for like two decades, okay? Here's the problem. We ran out, so when IP got started, it was using these IPv4 addresses. There are four billion of those. For reasons that are more complicated than I want to go into, at some point it became very clear that we were going to run out. We do not have enough. Now, you know, again, there's more than four billion people on Earth, and if every one of them had two devices, which is, you know, uh, uh, probably more than they're going to have, right, we'd have eight billion devices that would need to connect. So it's not clear that four billion was ever enough, but there are other structural reasons why it's difficult to make use of all those addresses that, again, I'm not gonna get into, okay? And so slowly but surely, the internet has been transitioning to use this different address format. And these new addresses are much longer. So this is sort of like the difference between an int and a long in Java. An int can store four billion values, a long can store like a lot, right? IPv6, I think if I remember correctly, you could give a separate IPv6 address to every atom in the universe. So that's probably enough. Right? Um, although I don't know, if every atom then decides that it wants both a laptop and a phone, then we're in trouble. Um, all right, so the other thing that IP lays out is how are the messages that we send across this that we're going to be structured, okay? So this is, you know, this is sort of, this is sort of a format that's not that dissimilar from designing an object in Java, 
right? We need to decide, you know, when I send you a message, what's gonna be in that message and how do I decode it? If I was just sending you random stuff, then you wouldn't have enough information to figure out what to do with the message. You'd be like, okay, I got some data, but I don't know how to, to decode it, right? What do I do with this information? All right, so here is the format, and then this is not gonna be on a test, but I just thought you guys might be interested to see it. This is the format of every single message that is transmitted across the internet. This is what's called an IP datagram. So a lot of this stuff we don't really need to worry about, right? Um, so this is information, this is called the header of the message. This is the first part. These two pieces, though, are, are pretty important, right? So one of the things that every message contains as it travels across the internet is where it came from. That's the source IP address. So that's how the computer that sent the message identifies itself. The other thing that it contains, and this is critical, is where it's going. Where is this message trying to go? That's the destination IP address. And then past that, there's some other information, and eventually what we get down here is just information, data. And one of the things that IP did, and you guys will learn more about this when you go on and take other courses, but this is a really, really powerful and beautiful idea, is that IP didn't create any rules about what you can put in an IP message. The header, you have to get right. That's the part that we agree on, is all the stuff that's in here. The data, you can send whatever you want. Doesn't matter. Now you and the person you're talking to have to agree about how to interpret that data, but IP doesn't care. IP has no objections to moving whatever you want in there, as long as you set up the header properly. I don't want to talk about this topic without giving credit to some of the people who were involved, and I, but I want to do this in an important way, right? So if you look at the people on this slide, these are kind of old white guys, all right? Um, and they're old now. When they were working on this, so let's go back in time 50 years, right? Actually, about 50 years ago, one of the first internet machines was actually arriving on this campus. Internet, uh, Illinois actually hosted one of the first uh, nodes in what became the internet. But this was like, this was at the point where there were six computers hooked up to the internet. And nobody had any idea how to use them. What happened was there was, there was a bunch of graduate students that got a hold of these, right? Because these are the people that like are excited to work with this new stuff and they want to figure out how it, how it goes and the professors are all like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm too busy, I've got a paper to write or whatever. The graduate students are like, Somebody sent us this big piece of equipment in the mail and let's play with it and see if we can get it to do cool stuff. So that's what they started to do. As they were doing this, so, so, there, so, so essentially there were all these graduate students around the country at different institutions that were unboxing these big, you know, these things were like the size of a closet, right? They barely did anything, right? But they're boxing them, hooking them up to the phone lines, figuring out how to get them to connect to each other and stuff like that. The whole time, and you can, I mean, you can read interviews with these guys. I mean, Vince Cerf is still alive. Bob Kahn has died, unfortunately. Uh, Vince Cerf now works at Google as sort of an internet evangelist and has continued to speak out about the future of the internet. Um, but, but what they kept saying is that they kept wondering, like, when are the people who are in charge going to show up? And this is sort of, I feel like, the story of technology in our, in our era, right? There's a bunch of, like, people that were kind of making it up as they went along. And they kept, like, they literally kept waiting. It could be like, well, s at some point, someone from the government's gonna show up with a suit and be like, okay, guys, we got this, right? We have a plan that we've made before. But it turned out that no one had a plan. Um, and so these protocols were invented by some of these graduate students, like when they were in graduate school, right? Because they found a cool problem to work on. They also worked together in, I think, this extremely laudatory way. So the, if you look at how the internet has actually been standardized, so there's a bunch of documents that lay out how each part of the internet works. And these go all the way back to laying out IP and a bunch of the other protocols that operate on top of the internet that we'll talk about next time. Does anyone know what these are called? They all have, they, they have a number, so there's like thousands of them now, but there's an acronym for them. If you go up and look like, you know, uh, and there's a whole website where they have every single one going back to the dawn of, of the internet. Does anyone know what they're called? 
They're called RFCs. Maybe that rings a bell for someone. Does anyone know what RFC stands for? RFC stands for Request for Comment. So the graduate students who were in charge of this were worried about offending the people who were in charge. And so they didn't want to make their documents seem like they were, uh, they were like the instructions, right? They didn't want to make people think, oh, these graduate students are starting to take over, right? So whenever they agreed on something, they wrote up as a request for comment and then they would send it out. And then, you know, later, if the people with the suits came back, they'd be like, oh no, we were just, you know, we were just asking for help, right? It's just a request for comment, right? Well, you didn't comment, so we just decided to go ahead and do that thing, right? So again, I mean, and this is a, this is a process, and this is a system that persists to this day. There are still committees that are involved with, you know, uh, continuing to guide and shape the future of the internet, and they still use the RFC system to propose new ideas and get feedback back. All right, so, I think we're gonna stop here and we'll talk about um, routing next time. Um, that's all I have for today. I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. It's beautiful outside. I have office hours today, one to three. I hope to see some of you there. Um, if you are working on MP4, good luck finishing up this weekend. This is our last machine project deadline. Uh, we will start work on the final project next week. Have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday. <laughs>